Well, everybody, welcome back to another Canada Immigration Live q and I'm here with uh, Alicia backman Bahari. How are you, Alicia? Doing all right, Mark. It was just Halloween last night, so it was, uh, it was a late night. There was a room full of teenagers over here. Everybody was having a, a good time. They were playing games and our house was very loud, but it was all good fun. And it was fun to see all the kids coming by with their costumes. Awesome. That's fantastic. And so did you have a lot of trick-or-treaters? Not really. I mean, we only ever get like, I don't know, maybe 40 or so. They all kind of come in a wave and, and then off they go and nobody really comes by super late. Yeah. Well, this year we, I was surprised we had more kids and more teenagers and more young adults actually trick-or-treating to our house than we've had, than we've had for years and years. And uh, yeah, it was it was actually quite fun. And the kids had their big um, Halloween bash on Saturday. So we had all of the, you know, the uh, decorations up and we had this big cobweb that stretches across our step, which now we're need, going to need to take down. But um, but yeah, we had a lot of kids that came and yeah, and some older kids. I've never seen, uh, you know, teenagers um, and we're not talking teenagers like these are probably like 19, 20 year olds. Uh, dressed up trick-or-treating and I'm like well sign of the times hey if, you, if you're looking for candy and you can't afford it because you're trying to pay for your rent well hey there's a good place to do it so it's just go trick-or-treating with your pillowcases and uh, you know I just wonder how many countries like I was talking to my brother who's over in Australia and I said you know do they do a lot of trick-or-treating there and each country, it seems like, you know, they, they celebrate it to, to different degrees. And my son just got back from Chile and he said, yeah, it's not really celebrated that way. You know, and even, uh, you know, I, my understanding is that um, Chileans don't celebrate even the Day of the Dead like they do in Mexico. And uh, but he said, still, kids, you know, you watch on TV. And so they were still going around hoping people would give him candy. And, and <laughs> when he was down there in Santiago. So um, it's just fun. It's just good fun. All right. Well, let's see. We've had a few things going on. Um, if those of you who've been watching the channel probably tuned into the, the watch party yesterday to see what the future of Canadian immigration had in store, uh, the, uh, the minister, um, Minister Miller here, uh, did a, a live kind of, uh, I guess, event is the best way to describe it, a little Q&A uh, at the end of it, just describing... Um, some of the things they're going to be doing in the future to, to try to sort out and rectify all of the issues that are going on right now. And um, yeah, it's really, really tough to, uh, to, to sit through these because there wasn't a lot of substance, Alicia. And um, yeah, I, and I don't know what your thought is on this, but um, you know, last Friday we talked about uh, and since our last live stream, the minister uh, on Friday talked about the future of study permits and international students and a number of steps that they're taking. And I'd encourage people to go back to the YouTube channel and, and just check that out. So you can see here, this is the one that I did yesterday. Um, it was actually two hours by the time we listened to what the minister said, had the Q&A and then um, for him and then our Q&A when we talked about this. But there's a lot of people that are really frustrated, very, very frustrated with what is happening now especially when they came into Canada with a belief, a fairly held belief, um, that they would have a pathway to permanent residence if they did everything right. But it's simply not the case. And uh, in, you know, especially this, you know, breaking news here with the minister making announcements, he reiterated that there's no guarantee for permanent residence. And so despite, personally, I think, you know, the 18 month work, postgrad work permit extensions really did a disservice to people. Because for some people, they've drug out their temporary status another two years, in some cases, almost three years, uh, with this belief that there would be a pathway forward. And the minister has made, you know, a, a decision not to do CEC draws. And so I don't know what your thoughts are, are on this, Alicia, but I think to some extent, well, it could have been handled better. And I'll try to be as kind as I can. Yeah, I mean... I do understand the departments in a, in a tough space because, you know, they had no idea the pandemic was coming. They are trying to now on their back foot, trying to figure out, well, what do we do with all these people? How do we preserve status? But I mean, to be fair, 
these people had an expectation that if we go through, we do a PGWP eligible program at a DLI, then we're hopefully going to have that Canadian work experience and hopefully be able to get the points that we need for express entry. But really what happened was the points for express entry went through the roof, right? And so, and then there was no draws. So these are all the factors that are contributing to a very complex policy situation right now that involve real life people. So the thing that I do like is, at least in their materials, when we look at that plan, they do acknowledge, you know, we are dealing with human lives here. These are not applications. These are decisions that are going to influence humans in a very real and material way. What I am worried about is, you know, some of that commentary around, well, you know, it's a study permit program. It's not a pathway to PR. And yet, in the next breath, it's, well, we do want to make sure that we have pathways to PR. Well, what are those things, right? We need some more substantial details on that. Um, it is concerning. I see one of the one of the comments in the chat is it's concerning about, you know, what is this reassessment of the PGWP? How is this going to align more with in-demand streams? And how is that going to transition to express entry? But it almost feels to me like what they're going to do, Mark, is they're going to decrease the input, right? They're going to change that funnel so that they can process more effectively on the back end. And I think they might be getting more precise about who they're allowing in in the first place. Yes, absolutely. Um, we're just going to have to see how this all plays out. Um, it is, uh, <laughs> Spidey, <laughs> I did get your email. I did get your email, Spider-Man. So we'll definitely reach out and, and uh, see what we can do to help. Um, but yeah, this is, th there's just so much uncertainty now. And the problem that I always have is that there are these just somewhat vague references and, and comments. And sometimes Alicia, I wish the minister, I wish the department would not do this. I wish they would, when they have something concrete and they're ready to actually make a change or they're ready to, to shift, um, because all it does is create unbelievable anxiety in, in the lives of people that are here. If you're going to make a change, if you're going to rethink the postgrad work permit, if you are, you know, if you're going to reevaluate um, just more targeted uh, economic programs that that are specifically geared to meeting the needs of of the of the labor market, then then prepare, you know, put them together and then release them with details versus the announcements, because I don't, this, it doesn't help. And I think to a large extent, it, it causes more harm because people are now trying to second guess what the minister's saying. And I spent a lot of time dissecting the moment something came out of his, his you know, out of his mouth to try to interpret what that could mean. But there's a whole host of things that can drastically alter what's happening within the, the, in the whole world of international students. And I, I've said this repeatedly in the past, one of the issues, it's hard for the it's hard for the the government to go back now and say that, well, there's no guarantee when you know our previous minister, um, you know, Sean Fraser here, he spent a lot of time uh, just extolling the virtues of international students and uh, saying that they are the 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 ones that they want and that they will have pathways for them and they'll help them. And now, Minister Miller, who's really the fall guy for all intents and purposes, is now left holding the bag, trying to clean this up and trying to say, well, you know, we, we really love you guys, but there isn't really room for all of you. And so we're going to have to make some tough decisions. And well, that's just life. So as we're, as we're going through this and as we're, you know, definitely addressing people's questions here, um, you know, I think it's fair to be a little bit critical uh, about what's happened. And especially in light of the, those 18-month post-grad extensions, because why would you do that unless you were trying to give people an opportunity to, to still accumulate their work experience and then qualify for permanent residence? Because in my mind, it would be better you know, to say, look, there isn't going to be a pathway. And one year work permit expires, you're going to need to go home. Because remember, Alicia, there were a number of individuals that were out of status that were just swooped up and said, don't worry about it. It's okay. Even though you've fallen out of status, it's been more than 90 days. You can't restore. Um, we'll just, we'll just by grand edict, just wipe that away and allow you to get a new work permit to keep working. It almost created this, this false sense of security that, oh, it's okay. 
the minister will come and save us again with another work permit. So, um, so this is these are some of the issues that I'm struggling with right now. And you could see with Minister um, with Minister Miller, he, he was visibly kind of he was visibly you know uh, um, what's the best way to <laughs> to describe it um, flustered when he when he started talking and and he was really struggling. But I'll give him full credit, just like I said, because he was willing to to acknowledge where you know, where mistakes were made in the past. And, but the, the question now I have is, well, what are you really going to do? And having more consultative committees and, you know, more, you know, uh, outreaches to the community. Cause remember at the beginning of the year, uh, I think it was from February, March until June, they had done all these meetings and, and in the report that the minister talked about, he, um, that was released, they talked about how good they were and how, you know, how productive these meetings were and all the things that they learned. And my response is, come on, seriously, like you guys make whatever the heck decision you want to make. And you've got enough intel and understanding about this that you can just make some decisions and move forward. That's why you're elected to make those decisions. And I, I believe that, you know, the general populace has trust and confidence in, in, in the people that are running the ship. And, and, you know, you don't need to do consultations. You can just watch Twitter, minister, and you'll see where people's feelings are. So, and I know the minister's pretty active on Twitter, so that's a fair statement. All right. So, <laughs> yeah, Alicia. <laughs> the last thing I do want to say about this is really, I think everybody needs to watch out for themselves, right? Make sure that you are doing strategically what is going to put you in the best position to try to have your own pathway to PR. Like, don't rely on the department, don't rely on the minister to come out with some new policy to save you. Really, really make sure that you are maximizing your time, that if you are in Canada on a work permit, make sure you've got at least that one year Canadian high-skilled work experience. Make sure that it's for 52 weeks or, you know, over a two-year period that you have gathered at least 15 hours part-time per week to amalgamate that into a 52-week period, that you have those 1,560 hours that you can qualify for express entry. So make sure that you do that on your, on your own. Look at those PNP programs. If you're not qualifying for PNP, take a look at whether you can find an employer who's going to support you on an LMIA employer-specific work permit. Because once these policies, public policies, come to a close, there may not be any other saving provisions and there might not be another pathway for you. So make sure you're creating your own pathways and finding employers who can put you under employer-specific work permits, which is hopefully, if you've got an LMIA, going to give you those 50 arranged employment points and that might be your best bet. Yeah. And I was thinking yesterday as I was going through the report and uh, and just the government's, you know, the, the new website that they spent, I don't know how much time and resources to, you know, the web page to, to outline the strategy, which really didn't have a lot of meat to it. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I just, I just wish Alicia that, that there would be meaningful things moving forward. And uh, if things are not going to work out then just tell people, just be very open and transparent and say, look, we anticipate that maybe only 15% of you post-grad work permit holders are going to have a pathway to permanent residence. So, and, and so because of that, I was thinking it's not, it's not easy for us, you know, on a live Q and a here, and we do need to get to the questions to really dive into this. But I think as a firm, one of the things I want to let everybody know is that, um, we, we are going to focus heavily on advising you guys that are stuck and, uh, and, and part of the reason we have our consultative process and why we direct you to book consults with the firm is so that we can try to, to intercept your, your immigration history at the earliest possible stages so that we can give you direction and guidance on how to plan out that strategy to give you the greatest chance of success. And, you know, little things I've said repeatedly, if 49% of international students are living in, you know, in, in Ontario, studying in Ontario, well, there's only so many spots. And, uh, and you know, so <laughs> you need to choose wisely where you're going to study. But anyways, Alicia and I, I think what we'll do is we'll we'll create a kind of a separate little video here. We might do it as a as a as a pre-recorded and release it. But um, just strategies on how to you know what to do now. Now that we know that there isn't going to be room for everybody, how do you position yourself so that you have the greatest opportunity um, to to get permanent residence and the things you can do now to to make decisions to maybe change or alter your path if you still have time on work permits. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at now. 
All right. Um, okay, let's jump into the questions and comments. So Lee says, hi, Mark and Alicia, watching you from DRC. I'd like to show my, oh, my gratitude. That's right, Elise. Uh, to, to your course, it has really helped me prepare all my documents and my application has been approved in only four months. That is phenomenal. Okay, let's get some applause here. And and what Elise, I, that's right, Elise. I totally forgot about that. That's great. So if I slide over here, what Elise is referring to is our Express Entry course. And this is going to be updated because we're going to be doing another masterclass right away. But this uh, this is the course right here. Um, our express entry step-by-step um, -step course and masterclass. So this is the one that Elise is referring to uh, that has the complete walkthrough of every every part of the process from start to finish and then our, our, uh, our masterclass sessions that we do um, periodically as well where people can have access to this for life and they can come back to masterclasses as many times as they need. Um, it's just a, yeah, I just absolutely love doing this and it's so yeah, it's so much fun to see people have success. And I'm so grateful, Elise, that you were able to get that in four months. That's phenomenal. Way to go. All right, let's see what else we have here. Um, okay, this is a good question. So, and I know this is going to feed into a lot of the questions we get, Alicia. Um, uh, Ryan says, can you please elaborate on what they mean by reassessment of the postgrad work permit to cater it more to the in-demand sectors? Does that mean if I graduate from business degree, I may not be issued a postgrad work permit? And I'll be honest, Alicia, um, I have to say that that's a possibility. Um, I think they probably, like in my mind, I can't see them um, going to a world where they would just close it all off. But I could definitely see more longer term post-grad work permits maybe um, that are issued to um, individuals that are taking uh, programs that are really targeting in-demand sectors. I can see potentially even schools and programs themselves um, being restricted to post-grads. So we know that they're going to look at, at really um, cleaning up the education institutions and the DLI, which is a provincial matter, the designated learning institutions. But, um, but this is, it's all I can say, Ryan, at this stage is that, yes, it's possible. Now, for people that are currently going to school, that are already, you know, have their study permits, I, I really, really doubt that they're going to make any changes that will affect you uh, in terms of your ability to get a postgrad work permit. But but who knows? Um, but I, I just think it's a low likelihood that they would say, um, you know, retroactively, anyone now who's ever come on a study permit or is going through school is now going to, you know, if you haven't obtained your postgrad work permit by this stage, but, you know, you're not going to be able to. I, I just, I, I don't see that happening. I think they're going to set a, a kind of like a, a, a timeline where the changes are going to start to apply from and anyone before and this has been the history of immigration. We'll be able to continue to benefit from the previous um, policies. But what are your thoughts, Alicia, on this one? Yeah, I I would guess that they're more going to work on the schools. They're going to say, okay, these are accredited, trusted institutions, and we're going to make sure that those programs are DLI uh, from those DLIs are PGWP eligible. So I can see them saying, we're not going to issue PGWPs to schools that are not following the rules that are not doing the proper steps to make sure that they're legitimate and transparent. So that is something I can definitely see because if the provinces aren't doing that work, the feds do have a way to kind of turn off and on the taps by regulating who can get a PGWP. So that might be something that they're forced to do if the provinces and the, the institutions within the provinces don't actually kind of clean up their own internal um, house, I guess. So I think probably be careful about which schools you're picking. So make sure that the programs that you pick are from reputable schools that are at least hopefully two years in duration so that you have the best likelihood of getting that post-grad work permit. And we'll have to see how the chips fall. You know, they are talking about maybe they're gonna change the Immigration Act, right? And it's mm -hmm. probably time to change the Immigration Act because it was implemented in 2003. We have kind of this whole patchwork process of temporary policies on top of temporary policies on top of you know an amendment under a ministerial instruction it's it's a mess right now and so when the legislation gets that cumbersome and weighed down and there's so many exceptions to the exception it's usually about 30 years later that they decide to throw the whole thing out and start over again so it might be mm -hmm. that there's a new act um, and all we can say right now is 
go to reputable schools, target the provinces, target the type of, of experience that you are gathering so that you will be employable at the end of the day. Yes. All right, let's get to some more questions. Actually, I'm going to touch on uh, Iron MT here. Um, uh, I recommend that you book a consult, Iron MT. This, this is one of the issues that we have a lot. People have issues with their application and then they're wondering if it's going to be a problem. So in this case, Iron MT has, uh, will be eligible for Canadian citizenship soon, um, but they have two citizenships. And then um, it says, unfortunately, after looking over my PR application, I noticed my lawyer had only declared one of these two citizenships. Now that I'll be applying for Canadian citizenship, I will declare both. And so ultimately the question is, will this create issues with my application? This is something that we can't really answer. And, but I bring it up just because um, people have a lot of these questions, similar questions that are really specific. And we encourage you to slide over and book a consult so we can look at the whole situation. Um, do you need to declare all your citizenships? Well, it asks for it in the application. So yes, you do need to declare if you have multiple citizenships, but there's always going to be one that you're going to be landed under. And so, um, you know, will it be a problem? This is something that we can't answer. Uh, you really need to book a consult so that we can sort it out. And I'm, I'm always curious if it was a lawyer or a consultant uh, who assisted you with your application. Um, nobody's perfect, but uh, I've seen a whole string recently of, of consultations that I've had where people just got bad advice. And if it's a lawyer, then, and, and there's something that was an, an area of negligence, well, then you need to report them to the law society. Um, and if they're, you know, if it was a consultant, then, well, good luck is my response because I don't have a whole lot of faith. I know Alicia always cringes when I say that. <clears throat> there are wonderful consultants out there, but the organization is a disaster. So you can we'll also that. report them too. You should report them to the organization <clears throat> for consultants. <Yeah. clears throat> um, but whether you're actually going to get effective redress or a remedy is difficult. That's another for discussion. And uh, yeah, and I'm not saying this in a silo, you guys. I've tried numerous occasions over the years, many, many times to, to, to get redress for people who've received just bad advice by their, their consultant and it's never gone anywhere. And so I, I'm a little bit jaded with the process, even with the third incarnation here. And um, so I hope, <clears throat> I hope things continue to improve, but I'm not seeing signs of it. Okay, let's move on here. <laughs> so Avalon, at least just like Mark, seriously, come on. Okay, so Avalon uh, says in the personal history section, okay, of the Schedule A background declaration form, and I, I'm assuming that Avalon is, is submitting this through the PR portal and it's not an express entry, I'm assuming. And, and because Avalon, if you're being asked to provide a Schedule A in the context of an express entry application, <clears throat> you need to book a consult immediately so that we can go in and figure out if IRCC has an issue here and they're asking you to complete it, um, you know, because you've missed something that they've caught and they're just waiting to find misrepresentation. But if it's just a PR portal, uh, regular application, um, like you're filing a provincial nominee application or something like that through the PR portal, um, you're, the question is, should I include internships and part-time work while I was a full-time student? And Alicia? <laughs> Yeah, so this is always one where, yes, everything needs to be properly disclosed. You do need to be careful in terms of what your points were that you were claiming under that PNP. I'm, ass I'm assuming like Mark that it's not express entry linked, but each of the provinces usually has some sort of point system. And so if you declared foreign work experience as an internship because it was paid, so it has to be paid, you're allowed to normally declare that for foreign work experience, even if you were a student, as long as it was outside Canada. You're not allowed to claim Canadian work experience while you're a full-time student as an intern. But if it was outside Canada, you can usually claim that as part of your points. It depends on the province, to, so be careful with that. But you also are going to then have to back that up with documentation to prove it was high-skilled, it was paid, and you've got letters from that prior employer as well as pay stubs, tax documentation. Sometimes if you're not claiming any of that for points, you will want to make sure it's in your Schedule A, but you maybe only put it in your personal history and you don't claim it in your work experience. So, you know, this is again, we can't answer what you should do. We're just giving general immigration information. If you want specifics in terms of what should you do as an immigration advice, please book a consult because we need to understand way more about your application, what category you are applying under, what are the specifics for what's going on in your life so that we can give you advice that understands the context. 
Yes. All right, let's, <clears throat> when I scroll through these, sometimes I see comments, Alicia, that just demand <laughs> that I pull them up. So Vera here, hello, Mark. Please do you advise I enter the pool with an imaginary IELTS. I'll be writing the exam soon. What's the implication if I get an ITA? Um, Vera, there's no way in hell you want to do that. That is misrepresentation. And when you submit your application, it's not going to help you in any way, shape or form, regardless of, of getting an invitation to apply. So are you just going to put in fake information? You know, if that's the case, literally there's no advantage to it because when you get your ITA, you have to provide the actual documentation to support what you put in your profile. And so no, under no circumstance would you ever want to do that. There was, there's absolutely no advantage to it. Um, Alicia, over the last while, we've seen a slew of TR to PR pathway applications being rejected um, because individuals put in fake, uh, you know, IELTS results, or they, um, they said that they were going to take the test, but didn't have it yet, hoping that they could then marry that future test up to their application. And it does not work, Vera. It does not. So, and I don't mean to be harsh, but anyone who tells you to do that is a freaking stupid idiot because there is no advantage whatsoever to doing that. Um, it's just going to cause more problems and cause an officer to think that you're not trustworthy. So, okay. I was, I'll, I'll, I don't know if you have any <laughs> additional thoughts well, on that. But it just horrifies me that people would think that's even an option or, or something that would be good to do. So, yeah. And maybe we can touch on Sahil here's question too. Um, and it's another express entry one. And, and it's the question is, can I include foreign work experience in an express entry profile that wasn't yeah. previously mentioned in the study permit or work permit applications? Would that be a misrepresentation? So, you know, these are kind of similar questions. It's immigration now with the advent of all sorts of advanced analytics and artificial intelligence and yeah various ways to cross-reference all your applications that you've ever submitted your entire life, they can now see what you put on your study permit and your work permit applications. And if those things don't match up with what you're now putting on your express entry application, they're going to have some questions legitimately. And you know, people say, oh, well, I forgot what I put on that first application, or I used a consultant, or my family member told me to put this, or I forgot about those things. Immigration is not a place where you want to be sloppy. This is where you kind of need to up your game and you need to be very con like concerned about exactly what you put in every single one of your applications. And if there is an error in any of those applications, you need to own it and you need to fix it and make sure that you're being truthful. Because from immigration's perspective, if you submitted a study permit application six years ago and then a work permit application two years ago and you never talked about supposedly work experience that you had in your country of origin seven years ago and now you're trying to claim it for express entry they're gonna think that it probably doesn't exist and you're just yeah. creating it yep there's something fishy and we'll pull up usman's question here do we have to provide documents for activities mentioned in personal history no you do not now he indicates here and this is the problem once again um can we skip mentioning work experience as unemployed for the time we don't have documents? See, this is once again an example. Usman is basically saying, well, I don't have the documents. And, it, you know, and this is the miss, this is the stupid, confused people online who are, who are offering this horrible advice. No, if you're, if you're anything you enter in your personal history, you don't have to provide documentation to support it. You have to be 100% true with your answers, complete, making sure everything is correct and not omitting things. And, um, and so, but if people don't know that, people are like, well, I don't have documents to prove it. So I'm just going to put that I'm unemployed. Well, Usman, that's misrepresentation. And I've seen this, boy, it's been a number of years since I've seen that type of instruction. And the problem is that these online forums, sometimes people post these things years ago as solutions and said, it worked for me. And, um, and it was completely wrong. And, you know, when you're going online and this is, you know, I, I flip, I flip back to my, um, uh, the course here, part of the reason I created the course and all of these modules and all of these to cover every single section and all the supporting documents. The reason I created this was to try to to offer support to people who may not otherwise be able to afford 
you know, to retain our law firm, but still get the full force of, of, of guidance and direction to avoid these exact kinds of, of problems. And this is really elementary 101 stuff for express entry. But yet there's still this confusion that exists because people are relying on this information online that really is not vetted. And, and one of the big issues I have, Usman, I'll, I actually did a podcast on this exact topic. Whoops. And uh, if you were to go in and go to the YouTube channel, you'll see that um, there was a, uh, I think it was like heartbreaking immigration story, I think I called it. Um, there was a couple who were in a very similar situation to Usman, but theirs was in the context of work history. So they didn't, um, someone had told them that they didn't need to include work history that they didn't want to claim in their work history section for, for spouses for overseas work. And you don't. Uh, if a spouse has work experience um, in the work history section of Express Entry, you only need to include uh, work history that you're going to claim points for or affects your MECs, your minimum entry criteria. And uh, and if you don't, you know, as a spouse and you just have foreign work experience, then it says, do you have work experience? I just put no. But here's the thing. In the personal history section, I fully disclose every ounce of what that person has done over the past 10 years. Well, this couple followed what another couple from their country had done. And instead of listing what the husband did in the personal history, they thought they should just put unemployed. Okay. And then guess what happened? Their application, they got a procedural fairness letter and then they contacted me. And, um, and I can tell you, they, the officers were like, really? The, the husband hasn't worked for 10 years? And so this is the issue. And when people don't understand why they're asking the questions they're asking, then they start to make assumptions. And so the reason that this couple relied on their friends so much is because they did the exact same thing and their application was approved. No officer said anything about it. It was wrong and they should have had their application rejected for misrepresentation, but officers don't catch every mistake that a person makes. And so then when that goes, that, that person does that, gets their PR, then they tell everybody else, hey, this is what we did. It worked so good, right? When in reality, it could be disastrous instructions that they're giving. So, yeah, so, and, and we're going to do another, um, we're going to do another masterclass for the course here right away, but you can log in right now. There's links in the description where you can actually subscribe to the course. And I encourage you guys to do it. And, and like I said, the masterclass, we'll probably do another one here in a couple of weeks. But Alicia, any additional thoughts? I know we beat this one to, to death, but anyways. Yeah. I mean, and this is something that comes up over and over again. I had a consult um, just yesterday and somebody was working on their express entry application and the issue came up and they said, oh, well, do I put my internship in my work experience or not? What is my start date for my work period? Because their employer, they had an old employment reference letter and the employer had just counted from when they started as an intern. Luckily they were paid but they weren't full-time hours and so I said look no you've got to go in and change your express entry profile if it's not accurate. If you put that you were working you know 30 hours from day one but you were not working 30 hours you were working part-time as that internship put that as a separate period of work or don't claim it right put it into your personal experience. So there's all these things where you've got to be really careful sometimes you have to go back to your employer sometimes you have to tell your employer you need to be more specific in your letter of employment separate out that part-time internship and the job duties and then when it became full-time and what the job duties are and the pay because then the pay goes up too so be really careful about these things it might require you going back to your employer it might require you providing an explanation in your letter of explanation to immigration to say why you changed things from your initial profile to when you're submitting your eapr You've got to be so careful about misrep. You always have to be honest. You've got to fix it. So just make sure that you're doing that. <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I just, it's, it just boggles my mind that people are, well, it doesn't really, Alicia. Like there's some bad actors out there. There are some bad, crappy representatives out there. There are bad individuals that, that are not, you know, even regulated immigration consultants or lawyers. They're just people helping their fellow countrymen who are constantly giving advice um, where they have no freaking business doing it. And then they spread these, this messaging that it's, it's better to keep something concealed and not disclose it because if you do, it could result in the refusal. But if you don't say something, maybe they won't catch it. And, and that type of a mentality has really, I've seen a real resurgence lately, especially for people, <clears throat> for example, 
individuals that because of the craziness in Canada with extending work permits have worked without authorization. I wonder, Alicia, how many of the people applying for those 18-month post-grad extensions who had fallen out of status had kept working and said absolutely nothing about that work on their work permit applications. I, I would bet, you know, that because you can't just chill here. I couldn't hang out for months on end without working and getting getting employed. But the reality is there is still a pathway forward, even in those circumstances, by being honest and saying, hey, I, I had to work. And what, what people don't understand is that immigration officers, when they see that you're trying to come forward and be honest and tell the truth and take responsibility and explain the crazy circumstances that led you to do what you did, I... I'll be honest, Alicia, I don't know if I've ever had IRCC throw the book at a client of mine that has come forward and been honest and disclosed. I remember once um, I had a client who was in Canada a little bit, they, they had a refusal and then, and then they left after three weeks to go back to the Philippines because the, the employer had, had failed to apply for the LMIA and so we had to do it and there just wasn't time to get the work permit in. And so in the Philippines, they refused it because they said they took too long to leave, you know, but, but even in that circumstance, we didn't conceal anything, right? Um, and then I just reached out to the program manager and requested reconsideration and said, look, there's no defined time on how long you have to, you know, how soon you have to leave what is you must leave immediately from Canada mean for someone who's been here for five years? Anyways, in the end, the work permit was issued and the person came back. But but there's so much misinformation out there about just lying and, and somehow that that's a good strategy. And it never is, um, especially for the individual who said, now I'm applying for citizenship. And, uh, you know, how does it impact me when I have more than one citizenship and I didn't disclose it previously? Oh, boy. I think it's just one of these weeks, Alicia, where there's just been this wave of people who've been given such horrible, crappy advice. And very often, I have to tell them, I, you know, there isn't anything that we can do about it, um, at least in, in, in a lot of situations. Um, I see a message here from, let's see, I think it's on... I think it's Andrea. She says, good morning. Happy Halloween. It was really a crowd here in Vancouver. So much fun. And then, uh, by the way, restoration submitted. Client aware of possible negative outcome. We'll immediately refer him with you if, you're, if refused. And, and thanks. We, we appreciate that. So sometimes when things do get rejected and they're rejected improperly by an officer, there are pathways that we as lawyers can work with people to, to try to overcome it. Um, and there's a little bit of a backstory here with this. I think... Um, yeah, that I was going to connect with uh, with uh, Andrea a while back um, when she was doing this, just to help with some strategizing. But no, we're happy to happy to help and support you in whatever way we can. All right, let's see what else we have here. Um, Nita says, "Can you please let me know if a letter of invitation, flight booking, hotel booking is mandatory for Canada's digital nomad visa application?" Oh my goodness! Seriously, okay. I'm going to, I can't help it. Seriously, fr seriously, Fraser, like, <clears throat> okay, I'll let him go. All right. Um, will zero travel history be a problem for the NDV application? I sure hope people aren't marketing this and, and overseas agents selling this as a, as a great tool for coming to Canada and then shifting to a work permit. Um, Alicia, can you shed some light on this digital nomad visa? Uh, okay. So, there is no such thing, really, as a digital nomad visa. You either qualify for a temporary resident visa if you're from a visa-required country, or you don't. So depending on your country of origin, some people will require a visa to be able to enter Canada as a visitor. Some people will be able to enter with an electronic travel authorization. It depends on your country of nationality. You can look it up online. If you need a visitor visa to come to Canada, then you have to meet all of the same things that any visitor to Canada has to meet. So you have to prove that you have a temporary intent. You have to prove that there's a purpose for your stay. You have to prove that you're going to abide by the conditions of your entry. And the way that you prove that is gonna be a little bit different depending on how you actually are able to pull your evidence together based on your life circumstances. <laughs> Mark's gonna pull up the digital nomad. All right. I, I'm sorry. I just, it just, it's so frustrating. Okay. Do you see this? This, this is what drives me crazy. So here's the link. Digital nomads processing time zero to two months. Nomads don't need a work visa to work remotely from Canada. 
and I'm sorry, Alicia, like it, this has been this way since time immemorial, since the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. You can visit for up to six months. Choose this option if you work for an employer outside Canada, can do your job remotely, want to experience Canada. Okay, great. And then get started. How do you get started? You go to the bloody visitor visa normal process here. It's just like, um, it, it's just so frustrating. Um, okay, I'll stop talking, Alicia. And just be really careful about this because digital nomad, it just largely means you're coming in as a visitor, you're working completely outside of Canada. So be super careful. If you overstep the bounds, if you do anything that is considered to be work inside of Canada, the definition under regulation two of work is extremely broad. It can be anything for which compensation is earned, commission is paid, or that a Canadian would normally get paid to do. So if you are working for a foreign company, but all of a sudden you start doing work for Canadian clients for that foreign company that's probably entering the Canadian labor market and guess what now you need a work permit and you're in breach of immigration rules because you've worked in Canada without authorization which can make you ineligible for a work permit for six months so be very very careful about this digital nomad strategy make sure that if you are in Canada under a visitor visa all that work is totally outside. You're working for an employer outside of Canada with no offices, branch offices, or Canadian clients. You're not getting paid in any sort of Canadian bank account in Canadian currency. It's all paid to your foreign account and your foreign currency. You're not doing Canadian work. Be really careful about that. But what you need to prove to get that visitor visa really depends on proving your temporary intent. There are some policy guidance that you can look for. One of the things that um, I've helped develop for our clients is basically a temporary temporary resident um, visa intent tool, right? What are, what are the things that you should put in your letter to talk about why you have a valid temporary intent, how long you're gonna stay here, how you're gonna support yourself? Usually you wanna have an invitation from a, an invitation letter from a Canadian citizen or permanent resident who's also saying that you're coming to Canada for a specific purpose. I'm going to pull up Alicia. This is Spider-Man here and Spidey will talk about <laughs> the options that are available, but this has come up in the past uh, as well. If someone tries to apply for a work permit extension, in this case, Spidey's got January, 2024, essentially they know it'll be rejected because they don't have an LMIA or a pathway to extend. This is many people whose post-grad work permits are probably expiring this year or next year, well, next year, and they <clears throat> don't have an ability to extend them. Will the refusal negatively impact future applications? Many thanks. So what is your take? Like uh, ethically, you know, um, just professionally, I, I don't just file frivolous work permit applications that I know are not going to be accepted. Now, there's a big difference between just filing a frivolous one and, and trying to apply for one that's maybe a little bit more difficult to get, but you're still making a legitimate case for it. Like, for example, a, a significant benefit work permit. But what, what are your thoughts on someone who does this gets the refusal and they just want to get more work experience um, affecting future applications? I mean, it, as long as you're honest, as long as everything in your application is true and complete and correct and you're filing this application and you're hoping that you have some way to try to continue your status, you know, as Mark said, I can't file it for you if I know that it has no hope of success because I don't think it's ethical. Um, but really, Spider-Man, like have some sort of plan for what you're going to do in the future and what your backup plan is and what's plan A, B and C, um, because it's important to figure out what all your options are and then and then make a choice. Um, and we're happy to talk with you in a consult to do that. But it is tricky. I mean, it's hard when you're coming to the end of the road and you can't get that invitation to apply under Express Entry. All right, I am just gonna pull up here another question. This, um, <laughs> VJ will say hello to you. Okay, VJ says, after soft landing, if we apply for a PRTD from India, how big, I think, are the chances of rejection of a PRTD? Uh, okay, um, so soft landing, normally people will come, they will get their permanent residence, they'll have it signed off on their eCOPER or their physical COPER, um, and then for whatever reason, they don't decide to stay in Canada, they turn around, they get back on a plane, they go back to their home country. 
The problem with doing that is that when you do your confirmation of permanent residence, you also need to do this, this PR portal where you're going to put in your address and you're going to put in your photos and you're going to apply for your permanent resident card. And that normally is taking a, a number of months right now. If you are outside Canada and you are technically a Canadian permanent resident, but you have no PR card or ability to come back into the country, you have to apply for these permanent resident travel documents. The difficulty is it, the processing times are all over the map and things are not super good with India right now in terms of diplomatic relations and processing applications through the processing center because a whole bunch of our diplomats had to return to Canada. And so we actually probably cannot tell you what a good chance of processing time would be for this application because the processing times that are posted online are probably um, maybe generous. It's probably worse than what it's saying right now because it hasn't had time to catch up with the fact that not a lot is going to get processed for now through India. Hmm. Let's talk, uh, let's address this one from Bavik. And this is one we get I haven't had this one for a while either, Alicia, but uh, he's he's in the pool, no nomination or ITA yet. Is it recommended to withdraw the express entry profile to avoid dual intent? Um, how to convince a visa office that I won't overstay is express entry and visitor visa declaration compared. So um, really what this is coming down to is this concept of uh, immigration choosing to... Um, interpret you submitting a profile in the pool as having permanent intent and thus resulting in possibly a refusal of say a visitor visa to Canada. So what are your thoughts on on this whole issue Alicia? And in particular someone who has already submitted a profile, it's already in the system and then decides, well I'm going to withdraw it and then I'm going to submit my temporary application whatever it might be. I just don't think there's any point. They already know that you submitted your express entry application. They have all the details. It was in the pool. Just acknowledge it, right? Just acknowledge the fact that you had your express entry profile in there, that you do have a valid dual intent, that, you know, you you have some way to show that you've got ties to your home country. You've got enough money to support yourself. You're going to come here on some sort of visitor visa or maybe a study permit. And if you're eligible, you might submit an express entry application or continue your express entry. Or if you got an ITA, you would go ahead and submit your EAPR. It's all right to have a dual intent as long as your permanent intent does not wipe out your temporary intent. You have to maintain both. And I think artificially kind of withdrawing an express entry profile just to submit the visa doesn't really help. They know it's there. So you might as well tackle it head on. I'll pull this up from Gummy, who's I had an individual who tuned in yesterday who was also on board a ship traveling around the world. And um, this is something we see a lot of, Gummy. And this is where immigration laws and, and the policies don't always align with everyone. So in Canada, U.S., and all over the world, mariners work on rotation due to labor laws, as one cannot spend an entire life on board a ship. So can I explain in the LOE the same and claim full-time work experience in FSW? Mm -hmm. And and Gummy, I think we've kind of touched on your questions a few times yeah. over the weeks. You know, it really depends on how long. How long are you on? How long are you off? Are you paid for time where you're on shore or are you not paid at all? Because it's a misrepresentation issue and it's an eligibility issue. So in your application for express entry, you just have to be absolutely honest. Here were the periods of paid work. And here's what I'm going to claim for points. And here's how I meet those eligibility requirements. And then in your LOE, as long as you were honest in everything you put into all your fields in your express entry EAPR, in your LOE, you can make your argument. You can argue your case to say, look at this is what is industry standard. But you can't misrep, right? You still have to be honest in your application. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just going to pull up this one here, and I'm trying to make, see exactly if I can understand. These are the ones that are really important that we clarify. So if you disclose and do self-claim your past criminal record for PR application, would the immigration officer consider this while working permit not disclosed? So, all right. So Picasso, basically what they're asking, I think what happened is on the work permit application, they didn't disclose the prior criminality, but now it's come up for PR. And I think that's I think that's the issue. And Picasso says I think misrepresentation is considered serious despite of self claim. 
So this is, and maybe you can also clarify, Alicia, that this goes beyond misrepresentation. It goes to criminal admissibility to Canada. Mm -hmm. So Picasso, I'd, I'd highly recommend you book a consult so we can figure out exactly what happened when, where you are in the process. Um, in general, if you have prior criminality, so if you've actually been there's a few things, right? When you're doing your PR application, you have to, and actually, Mark, they've they've changed their format. So I was helping a, a couple file a spousal sponsorship through the portal, and they've actually, on the statutory declaration questions in Section A, they've now bifurcated it. They've pulled out, you know, have you ever been About convicted? Time. About and time they've, they've done yes, that. Yes. Yeah, they finally wow. pulled out. So convicted is one where you have to do your declarations, but detained, incarcerated, or charged is another bullet point. And I'm very glad they did that because uh, over the years, I, like hundreds yeah. and hundreds of times, people have said, well, I didn't know. It was all in one bullet point. They talked about arrested, detained, charged, convicted, all in one bullet point. They've now pulled it out into two bullet points. These are very important things. It really depends whether what you did was a crime according to an equivalency analysis. So you'd have to, or a lawyer would have to, compare what your actions were in the foreign country to see whether it would constitute an offense in Canada under an act of parliament. It can't be like a provincial like speeding ticket. Um, it has to be something that would be a criminal code offense or something that's an act of parliament, a federal offense. If it is a federal offense, then you would be criminally inadmissible to Canada unless you can prove that you're rehabilitated because of deemed rehabilitation due, the, due to the passage of time from when that offense was completed and that's the last thing that was completed, or maybe you have to file a criminal rehabilitation application. And these are really important things and distinctions that you understand to understand whether you are criminally inadmissible. If that's the case, um, you have to deal with that or always you're going to get refused. The second layer on to that is the misrep, because even if they can't get you on the criminal inadmissibility, maybe it's, you know, it's been too long or it's a minor offense and it's not actually equivalent to an offense in Canada. If you didn't declare that on all of your work permit and your temporary applications, then they can get you on the misrep because they say, look, that's a five year bar for not being honest about it. And you know, it's it's good that you're honest about it on the PR application because you have to be. Um, but I would really recommend you talk to an immigration lawyer who understands criminal and admissibility and you can get some specific advice. I like this one here from Yuvraj. She says, good morning. Glad to see Alicia return to the live. Absolutely. That is exactly my feelings. <laughs> All right. I want to just touch on a few very, very quick uh, questions. So we've got people here like we've got Jay Gupta here asking about, you know, should I, you know, uh, you know, should I uh, move or, or stay? She says, my Cirrus is 49. Think of moving to Alberta for tech. Fiance is waiting for a coper. Should I stick in Ontario, move to Alberta? Also, can I explain everything before the consultation with, with you start? <laughs> so, okay. So yes, Gupta, we definitely want you to book a consult. And just to clarify for people. So when you come in, you can schedule right now. All you have to do is click on the, the, the consult that you want. And then this is not something where we sit here for 25 minutes listening for you to tell your story to us and then saying, okay, well, you know, you'll have to hire us to get real advice. That is not the case. When we have you schedule and book a consult, we send you an intake form where you tell us your story. Now, we're not going to review your entire application in a consult, but the whole process of this is designed with when we are, um, when we're having people book their consults and that 25 minutes, we charge what we do for a reason, because all of those issues that you have, those, those questions, the uncertainty, it gets resolved, at least in terms of the advice and direction that we give you. It is strategic, it is direct, and you will leave the consult knowing or having a better idea of where you stand and what the options are. So um, Alicia and I have both been practicing for, well, I guess it's, we're just about 2024, like 20 years each. And so it does not take long for us to understand what you're saying. And when you send the intake form back to us and you fill out all your information, absolutely, um, we are ready to answer your questions right off the bat, not wasting time. 
So whether someone books an hour and listens to you tell your story for half an hour and then, you know, takes 10 minutes to give you, you know, some direction and then says, well, there's nothing more I can help. I, I can tell you for our consults, it's well, whatever you can, you can go check the, the reviews that people provide and make your own decision. But yes, a hundred percent, Jay, yes, you can, you can provide the information and then we can, you know, we can help you to strategize whether it makes sense to stay or or, or, or whether you should take a chance and, and come. So obviously a fiance is not a spouse. So you're not included as a dependent on their application unless you're actually meet the definition of a spouse. So, um, and then we have here, uh, so we've got Bobak. I'm not going to dive into this one, but once again, book a consult. Um, th this question is really, really serious. And uh, same thing for Abood, you know, um, you know, what do I do for all of these? And this is not just a boot, but it's everybody who's in this situation. A consultation is the best thing that you can do so that we can actually talk about what future possibilities you have and whether or not you have a realistic chance. 470 to 485, you know, when you're one of the massive, massive group, that cohort of international students on work permits, um, is there going to be a pathway? Well, if you're in Ontario, maybe there won't be. Um, you know, and so how much time do you have left on your work permit? You know, what's your experience? Uh, where did you study? Which province are you in? All these things. So we reckon, we highly recommend that you, you slide over and book a consult and, and we can help you and give you direction on those things. And then the last one here, um, uh, a Facebook user. So over on the Express Entry Law private Facebook group. Wow, there's amazing people are still going through that. Man, do I, Facebook frustrates me. Um, okay, I'm from Bangladesh. Last two months before I submitted my SIMP program, okay, um, before day-by-day -day SIMP program EOI points are raised, how much possible in for period? Yeah. I don't know if I can decipher what you're asking here. Um, obviously, it's about the Saskatchewan Immigrant Nominee Program, and I don't know if you are just applying straight up um, Facebook user or whether you are, uh, have received some type of a notification of interest and now you're trying to get the application submitted. Um, but yeah, as far as points rising, we're seeing those, the, the points for all programs across the country are rising because there's this massive glut of people that have Canadian work experience and, and no pathways. So I don't know, Alicia, if you can decipher anything. I wanted to pull that up because we don't get a lot through the express entry law group, even though there's like 115 to 20,000 people in that group. So, all right. And I think we had one super chat that came in. Um, and this is the only one. I think someone else mentioned something about a super chat, but there wasn't one there. So Ahmad says, um, Coper visible on tracker with expiry March, 2024, no portal email yet must have to travel for two months, safe to travel in this time. And what are my options? Perfect example. Once again, Ahmed, <laughs> even though he did a super chat for $6.99, my friend, we cannot tell you. We can't. You need to book a consult and we need to sort out exactly what your situation is before we ever give you direction and advice. Now, with this being said, uh, I think Alicia can confirm as well. If this is a uh, inside Canada, so an e coper situation, you have to be able to come back to Canada and land in Canada. A short little holiday or a trip away for a couple weeks is usually not an issue. You return back and then complete the landing. But if you are uh, outside of, you know, you're, it's an e coper and you're leaving for two months, then I don't, there would never be a situation where I would say you're just safe to travel. Um, there's always a risk that you get stuck outside. And if you can't get back, that it can affect your ability to land. But if it's a true coper, um, then in that situation, you know, the requests for visas can be made to visa application centers, you know, in other jurisdictions. But, you know, when the request comes in, you have to be prepared that it's going to create huge delays if you're having to get instructions from IRCC to complete landing in a place that they don't already expect you to be. In other words, where your residence is. So and Alicia, any to last? Notify them. Yeah, and to notify. So any other... Any thoughts on this before we wrap up here, Alicia? Yeah, I mean, if you are going to be traveling, it does really make a difference if you're an inside Canada or an outside Canada applicant. Um, so be careful about that. I mean, you, you've come so far, you're so close. You know, you might need to delay that travel, but really we can't tell you unless we understand more about your situation. But do be careful if you are traveling to notify IRCC to make sure they understand where you are and why. Um, 
and hopefully you can just land first and then, you know, yes. delay that travel. But we would need to know more. And there was just one last question mark from yeah. IELTS expiring. So um, oh, that one. I see. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I just deleted that one. Yeah. Universal Cricket says my IELTS is expiring a month after receiving AOR, submitted all docs and paid fees for express entry profile. Yeah. Do I still need to reappear my IELTS? So, yeah, I mean, be really careful if your your language test result is an essential component of your express entry. And if you don't have a valid language test at the time that you submit your EAPR, then, you know, that's the problem. If you've actually received your AOR and everything was locked in and completed and you pass that completeness check, then that's a different matter. So just, you know, be really careful about being clear about when your language test was valid and making sure it was valid at the time that you submitted your electronic application for permanent residence. <clears throat> and I'll finish with one last one that actually on the travel situation, the last one, should I travel? Okay. Here's poor Carlos here. And, um, yeah, Carlos, we've been battling this for so long. I'm so awesome that you posted the comment as a wrap up here. But Carlos was in the US and he got in Canada landing instructions by accident. So so they sent him the wrong stuff. They sent him, he's never been in Canada, but they sent him the Ecopa portal. And so that's, you know, these, and it's been a nightmare, Alicia. Like, I think that happened. It was like May or June, wasn't it, Carlos, I think? And repeatedly over and over trying to tell them, no, you're sending me the wrong stuff. I can't land. And back and forth. And I was like, okay, the last time he and I chatted, I said, you know what? Try one more time. At least now you have an actual real office because before he was just sending regular stuff. So yeah, finally sent me the proper form to complete my PR. Thanks for your help. A question, passport copy and pages with amendments. This is interesting, Carlos, because they should be asking for the entire passport. Um, but passport copy and pages with amendments. Should I just send all pages? What do they want to see? Send them all. Send everything. Send whatever. Like at this stage, my friend, it's been so painful for you. Oh my goodness. This is a, yeah. And there's lots of horror stories like this, but Carlos, you're kind of breaking new ground, my friend, for, for the craziness and insanity that's happened just to try to get landed. So oh, the other, yeah, go ahead. Before you ended, I yes. just had one last thing. I saw Spider-Man's question about studying and switching to a study permit. I do want to say, and Mark, this came up um, when you yep. were on a consult too. Please be aware, everybody, that temporary public policy for students being able to work for more than 20 hours off campus ends December 31st, 2023. So be so careful. If your plan to transition to some other status after January of 2024 is to try to apply for a study permit, be aware that, and I wanted to say this, and I would probably need to write a blog article on it, yes. Mark, but that temporary public policy to have students work for more than 20 hours off campus ends at the latest December 31st, 2023. So do not rely on the ability to work more than 20 hours during full-time studies past this year. Everything closes as of December 31st, 2023. Yeah. Thanks, Alicia. That's a great, that's a great point. All right, everybody, we are into overtime here. So we'll wrap it up. But thanks so much, uh, Alicia. Thanks for the great uh, support. This is so much nicer. I'll be honest, having Alicia here with me. You know, I've for years and years I've done this on my own, but the reality is uh, it's not easy to, to search around, search through questions, try to pick ones out that are the most useful. And um, yeah, and then and then try to answer questions as well. So at least while we're doing this, Alicia has the ability to to answer the tough questions while I'm searching through and uh, yeah, and getting to all the comments. So thanks, Spider-Man. Yeah, book the consult. Let's connect. <laughs> and uh, yes, and we'll go from there. And uh, individuals, I, I'm just going to pull up here just quickly, Kamyar. Guys, if you don't get your questions answered, we meet here once a week to do it for an hour. And we physically cannot answer everyone's questions. It's not possible. That is one of the reasons why we direct people who have specific questions that really are not of general kind of benefit to everybody to slide over to our, our website, book a consult. You can check out the reviews and, and see what people have to say about their experience. Um, but that is by far the best thing that you can do when you, you're unable to get your questions answered because often I don't choose them because they're too specific. Okay. All right. We'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs>
<laughs> That's funny. We'll leave it at that. Alicia is a realishable person too. So, all right. Thanks guys for tuning in. We'll 